So uh, let me now uh, just tell you a little bit about uh, tonight's session. It's the second uh, in five roundtables that the Amsterdam Center for European Studies uh, is organizing. Uh, the first roundtable dealt with public health. Tonight's roundtable uh, deals with the economic and social policy response to the pandemic. And each of these, uh, these panels um, has uh, three speakers from the University of Amsterdam, from uh, ACES, and one uh, outside guest. So the, the first is uh, Frank uh, van der Brucke, uh, who is the, the organizer, is a university uh, professor uh, at the, uh, the University of Amsterdam. Um, and a, uh, a former Belgian uh, Minister of uh, Employment uh, and Social Affairs. Uh, the second speaker will be uh, Jean Pisani Ferry, who is a professor at Sciences Po Paris at uh, the European University Institute in Florence, and also a fellow of Bruegel and the Peterson International uh, Institute for International Economics uh, in Washington. Uh, the third speaker is uh, will be um, Arnout uh, Boat, um, who is um, a professor of corporate finance and financial markets at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, and the final speaker will be Rul Beitsma, who is the uh, MN professor of pension economics at uh, at the UVA and is also a member of the uh, the European uh, Fiscal Board. So. We're going to deal with a series of, uh, of questions. The, we're going to, to start in a way with uh, what has um, already been done or what commitments uh, are there already from the EU institutions and from the, um, the member states, and this includes the European Central Bank. And one issue that will probably uh, come up is the, uh, the yesterday's decision from the um, German Constitutional Court, which challenges some of the measures that the ECB uh, was already uh, taking in public sector purchasing, um, and which may have some implications also for what it can do uh, in, the, in the current crisis. We will focus primarily um, on the question of what are the, the main proposals still on the table uh, for responding uh, to the, the crisis. Uh, but then of course also there will be the questions of what do the panelists think should be done? Which of these proposals do they prefer and why? And finally, what do we think uh, will happen irrespective of the, um, of our own uh, preferences of the panelists' own preferences. In a moment, I will give it over uh, to Frank uh, van der Brucke to uh, introduce the discussion and say more about the nature of the proposals uh, on the table. Um, but before I do that, let me just say uh, a word about how we're going to, uh, to run the, the session. E uh, Frank will speak for about two minutes, and each of the four speakers will have uh, five minutes to set out their views, uh, and then two minutes each to react to one another. So Frank, I, go, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for, for having us. Um, when you think about all the proposals that have been circulated and discussed, it is clear that the question what should be done, and notably what should be done by the EU, has many, many uh, aspects and many issues are at play and they are cross-cutting. There's one chapter, I would say, about changes in the rules that apply to the domestic policies of EU member states, notably uh, rules on state aid to the private sector and rules about their fiscal behavior 
that is the legacy of the Stability and Growth Pact. And there have been changes in those rules. So the Commission very rapidly initiated changes, both in the way stated and uh, the fiscal rules are applied, basically in the sense of more tolerance. But that cannot be the end of the story, so I would think. And, and I guess that our colleague Rule has some thoughts on that uh, during this panel. And then there is the other and, and very big chap on collective action at EU level, whereby there might be disagreement among people and among governments on, on three dimensions. First, why exactly is EU level collective action needed and on what scale? Question mark. Secondly, second dimension, which instruments should be deployed to organize collective action? And obviously today with the Karlsruhe ruling, we immediately think about the role of the ECB versus the possibility of fiscal initiatives by the EU, and that is clearly politically a very, very salient and, and far from innocent question. But when it comes to the EU instruments, you have another round of discussion on how to set up collective action in the fiscal domain, how to organize funding, etc. Now there is a third dimension, and I think uh, Jean pisani ferry has been stressing that in a number of recent publications. That is, what is the economic and societal objective of EU collective action, what kind of economic purpose should it serve? And I think Jean has been saying, well, we might maybe first discuss this question on the purpose of collective action rather than immediately go into the nitty gritty of instruments and architecture. I guess he, he'll come back to that, but also our colleague Arnaud Boot has been intervening exactly on, on, on this problem. What is the economic strategy that should be supported by EU collective action? In addition to all this, I would say, there's yet another question on many people's minds, which is to what extent the current initiatives will be a kind of prefiguration of a more permanent or at least a very long-standing toolkit of new EU instruments and how we should think about that. I would like myself, Jonathan, to come back in, when it's my turn very briefly on, on that kind of discussion, looking into sure. So to what extent is that a prefiguration of a more permanent toolkit? But I, I suppose we should first listen to what uh, Jean and Roul and uh, Arnaud have to say about this broad debate. Thank you, and uh, I'm very happy to be to be here for the, this debate. Um, let me let me follow immediately on, on what Frank just said. I think we should start from the recognition that there is a remarkable consensus on the type of policy actions that need to be implemented to fight off this crisis. Uh, virtually all member states are doing the same. There are some differences on public health policy, but on the on the economic dimension, it's very similar. I mean, we, everybody is trying to protect uh, jobs, to protect uh, household income, to avoid uh, business failures. Uh, that requires a lot of um, uh, public money. It requires um, significant um, uh, fiscal action. And uh, there is a consensus that this fiscal action should be forthcoming. And the instruments are also the same, like, you know, the courts are by it is in uh, the, the different variants, but it's in place in, in, many, in many countries. So that's not where the difference is. And I think it's important to recognize that from the start. So where are the differences? Well, there is a question of what the EU dimension, uh, as you just said, what are the EU public goods? Um, so you can do many things at the level of the member state, but what is it the common dimension? And I would say that there are significant EU public goods. Research on vaccines, on treatments. This is something that has obviously global dimension, but also a, a level at which the EU can, can make a difference. Um, everything that has to do with knowing better what the situation is, uh, tests, surveys, um, that's important at the level of each individual member state. 
but that's important collectively because we know that the, the virus circulates and so it's important to have common instruments for knowing better what's going on. We're not going to reopen borders unless we have trust in the fact that we know what's happening across the border. So this is also an important uh, dimension. And then longer term, uh, there is a need to build a collective health security. I mean, we, we, this crisis was a challenge to our public health system uh, in terms of uh, diagnosis, in terms of resilience, in terms of production capacity. Uh, this is a problem to which we can look for, for your contribution. So this, I would say that the first domain of really public good dimension. The second has to do um, with the fact that it's a common interest to avoid the doom loop. I mean, in the, in the financial crisis, we had this doom loop between banks and, and states. Now we have another doom loop. We're starting from a very dissimilar situation in terms of the fiscal strength of the various member states. And so some of the member states could be led to, you know, to do too little. And doing too little has consequences for them and can have very severe consequences for them, but can also have consequences for neighbors. So the idea that um, the avoidance of this doom loop was, uh, was important, um, I think it was recognized, and that's one of the reasons why the ECB has decided to, to stand behind and to make it possible for states to do what they've got to do. I would mention something, perhaps Arnold will go back to it, uh, which is the, the, the other longer term, the doom loop between states and businesses. Uh, the, the states with the deeper pockets will be able to bail out businesses, to help them restart, to help them reinvest, whereas states with um, you know, a scarcity of, of public funds will find it much more difficult. So we can uh, have the risk that this crisis will result in even more asymmetry within the EU and, and the Euro area, to a point where it could be really, really dangerous, I think, for the survival. Of, um, of what we're doing in common. So I think that's the second dimension that's worth uh, mentioning. And then there's a question of solidarity. You know, what do, what do we want to share uh, in terms of the, of the cost? Where do we think that there are some things we ought to do out of genuine solidarity? This crisis, in principle, it was a very symmetric crisis. In fact, it's a very asymmetric crisis. Now, why is it so? in large part by luck. If you look at the number of deaths per million inhabitants, it goes from, I didn't look especially for this, um, this panel, but you know, I looked a week ago, it, it went from three in Slovakia uh, to uh, 500 in, in, in Belgium. Uh, so a huge difference. Belgium is actually the country where the, the death toll in terms of uh, proportion to population is the highest. Why is it so? It's in part, it's geography. <clears throat> in part, it's because some country had the luck to observe the virus coming to the neighbors and take measures at an earlier stage, whereas in some other countries, it's it sort of spread under the radar for a long time. Um, in part, is the, the quality of the response, but that's just not, that's just only one part. It's probably not the major part. And in this kind of situation, do we want to share the cost or not? I think we should. I think, you know, it's, it's socially important, it's politically important. It has to do with the significance of what we're doing in, in the EU. If we don't want to share some of the costs in this type of situation, you know, the, the public opinion will ask, what's the name of the game? What are we there for? Is it just to abide by rules or can we expect something if things go wrong for us? Thank you, Sean. From public goods to solidarity, a critical link. Um, Arnaud, now you have the floor for five minutes. Welcome all. Uh, it's great to be in this uh, panel. Um, let me start out because I think I can nicely build on the comments of Jean, where uh, he laid out the three layers, basically, of why, um, why an European intervention a European intervention is truly needed in a crisis uh, that we are observing today. 
Um, let me build on. Let me build on one. Uh, I, I, I fully believe in. I fully believe in public goods. That there are several public goods where we have a common interest in Europe uh, to invest in those public goods, um, and that are that are substantial cross-border externalities by investing in those. Uh, the one I would like to build on is uh, Jean already alluded to it. It has to do with uh, what we uh, what we linked it to financial stability. While this crisis is has basically directly affected the real sector, and not directly, at least not immediately, the financial sector. Obviously, the fact that this crisis has major implications for the corporate sector will have implications for the banking sector. And by having implications for the banking sector, it can have implications for the sovereign. And the fact that the real economy is being hit also ha has direct consequences for the sovereign. So there is an all kinds of loops between the levels of the real economy, the businesses, the financial sector, as well as the government. So the, the, the big question is, the big, the big question is in the European context, where for a variety of reasons, one of them is the solidarity that, um, that Jan was referring to, but the other one obviously is the common currency, the euro. It is truly important that we maintain the viability of the euro. And that brings also the, in the earlier comments that uh, Frank was already making in the direction of the ECB that we might be talking about later. The ECB is going to play a crucial role in the monetary union with no truly central fiscal capacity, because that's what we don't have. We don't have the political and the democratic legitimacy for a central fiscal capacity. The ECB plays a very important role. The ECB can only play that role if it is to some extent legitimized to play that role. And that was also the reason why the emergency package that was agreed to by, uh, by uh, the European leaders was crucial. This 540 billion package was crucial. Just by the measures itself, including the sewer measure that's Frank going to talk about later, but also to legitimize the role of the ECB. The ECB cannot just act counter to national, uh, national authorities. The national authorities are democratically legitimized. And basically by showing a common approach, and a, a willingness to act jointly, they make it feasible for the ECB to play this crucial role in the background, because the ECB plays a crucial role. Now, the element that we are emphasizing is that particularly in the next step, where we are thinking about recovery measures, and uh, the recovery fund discussion, which is currently on the table, talks about investing in these public goods that Jean was talking about, what we, the, the angle that we are choosing is, we have to be very careful in Europe that we don't put too much trust in a top-down approach. And Jean has also written that in his own pieces. If you look in his pieces, he talks about that certain actions in the past do not have the best track record uh, that can be imagined. And this was uh, meant to uh, be serious criticism. So top-down approach is to some extent, it will be difficult. How do we make sure that a top-down approach leads to policies, particularly recovery policies, that are truly that are truly in interest of Europe and are not going to be considered a waste of money? So the thing that we have been emphasizing, and that's also what I what I what I uh, will finish my first intervention with, is we have been emphasizing that a bottom-up approach, where the real economy, the businesses, need to be able to be entrepreneurial, dynamic, coming out of the crisis, coming out of the crisis requires instruments which are different from the common instruments that are used in all the programs that we currently have. They are all debt focused. So all the businesses will come out, will come out heavily indebted out of the crisis. And if we want to resolve the, and if we want to resolve the crisis, it has to come from these businesses. And these businesses are all over Europe. And these are small and medium sized, up to 80% of the employment is in the medium and, the medium and small size, size businesses. So how can we create this local dynamic engine in order to have Europe basically come out of this crisis? 
And that's the equity type of instrument that we have been proposing. And we have been proposing to create a European pandemic equity fund funded initially by governments in order all over Europe to support the small, medium sized businesses. And we have said, and that's my last statement, uh, Johnson, we have said, we have said that it, that's essentially killing two birds with one stone. One, it gives, it's an equity fund. So it is not a transfer union instrument. So whatever the political disagreement and not between North and South or whatever, whatever uh, thing you want to describe is, this has an upside. So we are, so we are not talking about dreadful downside. We are talking about an upside. That's, I think, is going to be crucially important. And the second is indeed, we do believe that economic growth is key for getting out of this crisis. So thank you for, uh, for having me here. Many measures have been taken at the, at the national level. And um, if we look at the size of the measures, uh, they are um, on the order of 3% in, this, in terms of discretionary fiscal uh, measures, uh, about 3% in terms of, uh, uh, of automatic stabilizers. On top of that, there have been um, you know, introduced guarantees. Um, but these measures are uncoordinated. And it's very important to have some coordination of the measures because measures have uh, cross-border spillovers. Um, when I think of the need for collective action, I see both the short run and the longer run. The shorter run, in my view, is important to avoid, um, especially financial crisis. Um, some countries will not be able to take the measures that they, uh, that they would need to take. And um, to help those countries, I think we need to have collective action uh, in the short run, but also in the longer run, because in the longer run, we want to uh, build a stronger, uh, stronger EU. Um, now, what are the measures on the table? So, so far, there has been the, um, the ESM, uh, 240 billion, the SURE, which Frank will talk about, the European Investment Bank also, um, stumps up money that will be used for, uh, uh, you know, to, to support more investments also from the private sector. The Commission is working on a recovery and resilience facility, and that would leverage funds on the market and backed by larger commitments of member states in the uh, new multi annual financial framework. And this would then be passed on to member states in concessional loans. Now, the issue here is that this is a temporary facility and the European Fiscal Board has been in favor of permanent uh, central, capacity, central fiscal capacity to deal with major shocks. Um, and so in my, in my view, we need to have uh, permanent facilities. Now, um, I have two major worries and one of the major worries is uh, public investment, because what we saw in the previous crisis was that especially public investment or more generally growth friendly investment was squeezed and it was most squeezed in the high debt countries. Um, and this, of course, threatens to happen again. So uh, when talking about how to how to spend money in a recovery program, I think we should um, it is important to also look at public investment, which can be, which has a high uh, multiplier during crisis. It helps to stabilize, but it also strengthens uh, growth potential. And it can have potentially important cross-border spillovers. And my other worry is that after the direct crisis, we will move back to business as usual and um, only with higher debt, but no improvement in long-run prospects. And uh, there has been a lot of discussion in the uh, recent weeks about uh, ESM programs and conditionality. And um, in my view, um, uh, ESM programs with condition conditionality, they actually incentivize relevant reforms. And when I talk about conditionality, I'm not con talking about uh, restoring public finances in the short run, but I'm talking about taking those measures that 
improve the, uh, the long run growth. Um, so also conditionality can be actually very much in the interest of countries uh, concerned. Um, um, if we move to fiscal rules, um, the, uh, indeed the general escape clause has been activated, so there is more flexibility. Um, but the rules have not been suspended, so countries will still be judged on an individual basis. And um, I think it's, it's rightly so to have invoked the general escape clause, but we also need to have probably have a deadline or a review clause, and um, we need to have the conditions spelled out under which the, uh, the general escape clause will be revoked. Now, in the longer run, I think we need to look at how to reform the rules. There is a little appetite for this, but it is important given that, um, for example, the 60% debt ceiling makes no, no sense. So we need to have to differentiate probably and we need to reform in other uh, dimensions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rule. Um, there's a lot uh, to think about both in this intervention and in the, in the previous one, uh, and in both of them, the links between how do we respond to the current uh, emergency and how do we position ourselves for the future are central. And that, as Frank has already told us, will be a key theme of his uh, remarks focused on the shore. And you should probably begin by telling uh, listeners who may not immediately know uh, what the shore is. Yes, thank you, um, uh, Jonathan. Sure is the name of a new initiative that was launched by the European Commission. And it has, in a sense, already been more or less agreed informally by European leaders to do something like Sure. It is a pan European support system. And the support comes in the form of soft loans to member states, supporting national short time work schemes like Kurzarbeit in Germany, but many countries have such schemes. Um, obviously, this can only be a component of a much larger effort, but I think in itself, it's a very welcome initiative. And as an immediate answer to a very urgent problem, that is, you have to ensure that people can stay in jobs that are not fundamentally uh, let's say unsustainable, but just hit by this crisis. So as an immediate answer to an urgent problem, I think it's, it's, it's very welcome. It raises maybe one or two questions. Um, given that it provides soft loans to the member states and not grants, this is kind of an insurance against increasing uh, interest rates higher rates and shorter maturities for member states when they have to lend money. And so sufficiently long maturity of those soft loans and sufficient volume are key. Now the volume is set at uh, 100 billion, which is quite a lot. And in the paper that we have circulated, uh, we explain why this is quite a lot. Yet if you would need this kind of instrument for several months, it might be a little too short. So it might need more money. There's a minor issue on the decision-making procedure, which I will not go into. I'd like to, to look more into this question of whether it's a prefiguration of something else. The commission itself, when it was first presented, said this program is a kind of, it's a form of an emergency reinsurance system at the EU level of national unemployment benefit systems. And that idea of a reinsurance of the national unemployment benefit systems is indeed in the Commission's agenda for next year. Now, sure, in a sense, is about job insurance. It's not about unemployment benefits for people who are really unemployed. It's about job insurance. Nevertheless, it's interesting to compare it in, in, in the architecture to what a reinsurance should look like. And here, I think you see the, the limitations. I would even see the drawbacks of something that you have to organize in an emergency, urgently, ex post, 
when the crisis hits compared to something that you should create ex ante as a real insurance. Insurance would be based on ex ante rules and it would function as much as possible on the basis of automaticity, while sure has to function on the basis of discretionary decisions taken one by one in the council. I, I think it will work, but the fact that it has this non-automatic feature means that it lacks something that is important in automatic insurance mechanisms, that is that they change the expectations of all the actors because these automaticities are there. So later on we would need kind of a more automatic system, I would say. Secondly, there are no conditions to sure. So member states can do many, many different things and there is promise for support. This is absolutely understandable. There should be no conditions now. That's too complicated. But in the longer term, that is a little bit of a problem. One should delineate the kind of action that is supported and the kind of action that is not. Otherwise, you might end up in trouble. Obviously, if you would set up ex ante an insurance device, you would delineate and you would create a kind of conditionality, maybe not the kind of conditionality that Rul was focusing on, which is reform-oriented, but you would say, well, what is the kind of adequate and benefit system or adequate short-time working system that we would want to support? And this delineation, this kind of conditionality is obviously lacking. So I would say, um, sure, is very welcome, is a very good initiative, but being ex post and emergency, it shows also the limits of not having a toolkit in which you have ready for you on ex ante insurance mechanisms a true unemployment reinsurance. So that is still in the agenda, I would say. Thank you. Um, so before I let you all react to one another, um, let me just make an observation about these excellent interventions. And that is the extremely high level of mutual uh, agreement. So you focused on different elements, whether it be fiscal, uh, unemployment, uh, equity, uh, investment. Um, but what I, what I don't hear is the kinds of, um, of bitter disagreements which have played such a, a big part, for example, in the meetings of uh, the, uh, the EU finance ministers and indeed uh, in, the, in the European Council, uh, the debates, uh, for example, about uh, corona bonds and various forms of, uh, of debt uh, mutualization and so on. So uh, maybe in asking you to react to one another, uh, maybe I can also ask you to react to some of the voices which rightly or wrongly uh, are not with us here in this uh, this virtual seminar. So let me uh, let me uh, hand the floor over for two minutes to to Jean. But also let me say to the audience, um, please start uh, writing your questions uh, in the Q and A window because when we finish this exchange, it will be your turn. Um, I, I will be the ventriloquist dummy for your questions. Um, and then uh, you'll be able to pose them to the speakers. So, Jean. Let me add a little bit of pepper to the discussion. We, we are having um, a discussion on instruments. The different type of instruments. There is a budget in whatever form. Uh, there are loans. And then there is what the ECB does. I think there is a strong case in this crisis for a budgetary response. Why? <laughs> because you have an emergency, you want to spend now to address the emergency, and you want to spread the costs uh, over a certain period. And then you want also to spend on where there is a need to spend, and you want to finance by contributions that are more or less you know, GDP dependent. So basically, that's the definition of a budget with which you can, you can go into, into debt and repay the debt later. This, we don't have it. We have a budget that uh, has uh, uh, written in stone that you cannot borrow except to give loans, but you cannot borrow to finance your spending. 
And I think that's deeply inadequate with respect to the crisis we are facing. We would need to be able to spend and to spread the cost over a certain period. And to do that, you know, by financing by contributions, not by individual loans to individual countries. Now, you can try to mimic, you can use, I'm not saying loan instruments like Shure or what the ESM could be doing are useless. I think the conditionality should be strictly focused on the use of the funds, not on other aspects of policy. It should be addressed to the emergency that should be controlled, obviously. You don't give money just without, uh, without overseeing. But there should be no policy con conditionality with respect to other fields. And I, here I disagree with, with Rob. Now, finally, the ECB. The ECB is, is a, or was until yesterday, a very convenient toolkit because you could tell the ECB to do whatever has to be done. You could mutualize through the ECB without taking political responsibility for it. And what the German Constitutional Court said yesterday is no way. The ECB is not there to do fiscal policy. So it puts a different, difficult choice to the, to the leaders. I mean, they cannot do anymore with the ECB what they sort of were ready to do with the ECB without telling public opinion, very frankly. Now they have to, to face a choice. Do, do they want to have some form of mutualization or not? Thank you, Jean. So Arnaud, now over to you. Yeah, let me, uh, let me um, pick up on one item. Uh, and I think it came back in, the, in, in all three, um, Frank's, Jean's, and Roel's um, presentations. The issue of conditionality. Um, what, what this crisis demands is that money is not wasted. Yeah, so the, the effectiveness of how we use the money is core. And uh, for that, for that uh, I see measures that are very targeted as being desirable, because how, how, how can you otherwise be sure? And being targeted helps also along another dimension, and that comes a little bit in the rules, in the rules direction. One of the reasons why conditionality has been, look in the past, ineffective, is because certain countries Let's put a little bit pepper in as well, Jean. Uh, certain countries do not have the institutions to make any type of conditionality credible. So what, why do targeted policies potentially help? And I think Frank went a little bit in that direction. By having a mechanism like, like SUR, like that, uh, that strange word, this, um, this work um, compensation this work compensation, uh, compensation um, replacement, compensation replacement program, you do some institution building bottom up. You may impact how these type of these type of arrangements, which can be kind of naturally implemented in countries like Germany and the Netherlands, might be implemented in Italy. So you you in a sense you should look at these policies and you should design them and you should use them in a way that you do institution building. And that sounds, that sounds nasty, institution building, but you do create some rules of the game. And I think you should use them in that direction. And then you come a little bit more in the direction of rule because these, this type of institution building will be absolutely crucial for the Euro area in particular to remain together. And uh, Jean already has indicated that if it is indeed true, which I'm not yet convinced of, that this German court is truly bite, biting, it truly hasn't bite, because so far there was always an escape and there might be again an escape. Uh, for, for example, with this emergency purchasing program and with the OMT, would it be triggered in the future? Because those would be prohibited, I presume, by the, uh, because the, 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 the German court was not about those, but the German court would definitely then begin, be against those, those measures while the emergency purchasing program will be crucial to keep the ACARs, to keep the interest uh, differences closer together because we do not have a common budget, we do not have a common policy, etc. I do support Jan's uh, uh, conclusion that we cannot escape having a larger European budget. We cannot escape that. And now the question is, is there a trade-off to be made? 
that a larger budget can go hand in hand with using, for example, the Sapir report from years ago, where we can get to a reconfiguration of how the budget is being used, because the budget is being used for 60% is directed towards the past and not towards the future of Europe. Thank you. I, now I, I turn to, uh, to rule, and I just also pose one question for you, which I think is raised by uh, Arnaud's intervention and some of the, one could say that structural reform uh, policies don't have a very good uh, track record, either politically or economically. Um, should we distinguish between, and that's one of the reasons why con conditionality is problematic, that it's not necessarily convincing that it's uh, in the best interests of the countries to whom these measures are recommended. Can we distinguish between uh, what uh, Arnaud called bottom-up uh, policies, which let's say incentivize countries to develop their own institutional solutions and top-down ones, uh, which in which um, EU institutions and um, member states tell each other what to do? Okay, um, well, thank you again, uh, Jonathan. I'm not sure that our positions are so divergent because Jean was pointing out the uh, conditionality on the spending. And I think this is an important issue because, and I mean, now there is 240 billion available from the via the ESM, and this is uh, spending on healthcare and stuff that is related. And I think that. Um, you know, it's, it's not black white. If there is an emergency and a health emergency, uh, as is the case now, I think there is not so much reason to uh, impose conditionality. I mean, um, you know, you don't, if you want to combat a health crisis like this and you need um, masks and medicines, etc. cetera, um, you don't tie conditions in terms of some kind of structural reform. However, if we are talking more about a somewhat longer run, um, when the dust has fallen down, um, and we know that, I mean, the, you know, some countries had uh, problematic um, growth prospects before this crisis. Um, and they will have, you know, debt will be higher and they will not have better growth prospects after this crisis. And it is also quite clear that it is very hard for countries to, for some countries to do the necessary reforms, then uh, maybe they should be helped with some conditionality. And I mean, if we look at Greece, um, you, uh, and of course it should be, Conditionality should be specific to the country in, in question. And so, for example, in the case of Greece, uh, tax collection was a big issue. Um, so then the country should be helped with tax collection, which is also an issue in Italy. So this should be a program that is, you know, specific to the, to, to the country. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, let me stop here. Yeah, I... I... I learned two important things in the latest round of interventions. Uh, first, I think Jean's kind of axiomatic summary of why you need a budget is absolutely spot on. Uh, and I should say that many people, including myself, have been arguing over the last few years that if the monetary union would be equipped with well-organized insurance devices, then you might do with a very small budget. I think that argument fails uh, because you can have such an unexpected and big shock that it is not manageable by, let's say, normal insurance devices. You need a budget and you need the flexibility of a budget. I think that that point uh, by Jean was very well taken. And it would be good to try to explain it in simple words to policymakers, politicians, and people why you need something with the flexibility and the mass of a budget. Um, so I think that's an important issue. And I, I think that a kind of insurance reasoning uh, is a complement to having a budget. It's not a substitute. Uh, then coming to the second thing I learned, I, I was 
Arnaud's expression, institution building, is something I like very much. And we didn't work together, Arnaud and I. Uh, but as a matter of fact, the work we've been doing on unemployment reinsurance, also with other people at UFA, like Brian Burgoon and uh, Francesco Nicoli and Teresa Kuhn, the work we've been doing is very much, in a sense, in the spirit of institution building. The idea is that by supporting when countries are in need, national unemployment insurance systems, you also create a kind of a quality assurance. And that in itself is also the premise for the public support. So it's a kind of a virtuous circle, whereby you, you have some quality requirements on what you support. And that in itself is a necessary condition for public opinion to support. Uh, and this virtuous circle is institution building. Now, the kind of con conditionality you need there is indeed what, what I've called delineation. It, it's saying, what is it about and what is it not about? Uh, what is an adequate unemployment insurance system and what is it not? What is adequate short-time working schemes and what is it not? Huh? Um, and so my point on sure was that obviously the commission could not come up with anything of that kind because of the emergency. But in the longer term, you should try to learn from each other to look at best practices, also in short time work schemes, and do some institution building. And that should be in the longer term toolkit, I would say. Those, these are two important issues. I don't have time to go into the, the other discussion on conditionality, which is the reform oriented conditionality. But I guess maybe people will want to intervene from the audience. So thanks to, to each of the panelists. I'm happy to say we have a bunch of questions that have been posed uh, from the audience. And I'm going to take them in some groups and direct them to the people uh, for whom they've been explicitly. So I have two questions to start with uh, for Jean. One from Lex Lohmann, who asks, why is a demand side instrument like a budgetary impulse at all needed. The problem at hand is a supply side restriction. Uh, and then I have a question from uh, David uh, Bokor, who um, commenting uh, on the, um, uh, the German Constitutional Court uh, says that you mentioned that it has confirmed we can't use the ECB for fiscal policy. And he asks, is the door now closed for the ECB to buy commonly issued debt through the um, uh, multi-annual financial framework with long maturities. What possibilities and obstacles uh, do you see? So Jean, let me uh, let you quickly answer those questions. And I have a couple of questions for Arnaud and then for the other members of the, uh, the panel. I think I'm, on the first question, I think I never referred to demand management. I referred to public goods, to the financing of public goods, and to the fact that in a crisis like that, you want to spread out the cost of financing the spending over a certain period. This has nothing to do with demand management. This is purely public finance. So I'm not discussing whether we would need you know, a, a demand management instrument. That's a different discussion. I think it's not today's discussion. Today's discussion is really about the financing of those public goods. Um, and possibly also the, 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 the transfers, but, but something that has to do with the, the allocation and the distribution function of the budget, not with the stabilization function of the budget. I say word on the, on the issue of the budget, responding also to Frank, I'm ready to consider that there is no consensus to create a permanent budget. There can be a case for treatment to fight off this crisis and postponing the question of, can we agree on the parameters of a permanent budget? I think there is an urgency, and in an urgency, you should focus on what's really needed right now. Now, on the second question, uh, I think what the, my reading of one of the dimension of the, what the, the Constitution Court said in Germany, is that parliament has a right, it cannot be deprived uh, of, of deciding on anything that has a fiscal dimension, meaning a distributional dimension, meaning an allocation dimension. 
and that the central bank cannot do it. So it's, it's not about monetary financing. It's about preserving the right of the German parliament. So what they're saying is not that the ECB could not buy common bonds. I mean, the ECB can buy EIB bonds, it can buy uh, ESM bonds, and there's nothing in the, in the ruling by the German court that says it shouldn't. It says the ECB cannot um, decide on the spreads because that's a fiscal rule. That's what it says. And I think more generally, what it says is that anything that is fundamentally as a distributional dimension amongst member states is not the job of the ECB to do it, and that would be against the German constitution. Okay, now I'm unmuted, I hope. And um, I want to direct uh, two questions to Arnab, one which was explicitly for him from someone called Joscha von Spronsen. And he asks, regarding your suggestion of issuing equity, won't you reallocate the doom loop and limit the potential upswing for businesses? And then there's a question from Christina Howell, which is not specifically directed towards you, but I give it to you anyway. She asks, do you think there is a chance that the loan policy will change in the event of a strong second wave should the quarantine and economic shutdown be extended for several more months? Would the policy shift more into the direction of keeping citizens and small businesses afloat, even if that means the host country wouldn't be able to pay back the loan for many more years? So I let you tackle those two uh, questions. Don't have my understanding. Uh, How did the second question start? How did it start? What? It, it asked, do you think that there is a chance that the loan policy will change in the event of a strong second wave, that is of the, uh, the, the pandemic, should the quarantine and economic shutdown be extended for several more months? So is, if we have a longer shutdown, is the economic problem going to change and the response okay. as well? That's uh, what I understand. Okay, yeah, let me start, let me start with, the, with the second, uh, and also given that we repeated the question. Um, if the shutdown would continue beyond, say, six months, which I don't believe, which I don't believe, because I, I, it's not that I hope not naively optimistic, but I believe we will open up and all countries will open up with certain restrictions, which might make certain activities impossible, like certain type of uh, cafes might have in space, if I look here in Amsterdam, which is totally not suitable for whatever new rules we com come up with. But uh, so I do not believe businesses uh, that the restrictions on business closure will go beyond three months from now. So in that sense, I'm optimistic. But the longer the period is, and for sure, if the period draws beyond the next three months, we do have to think about the question, what, are the, what is the most effective use of the money in terms of, of preserving businesses that are true businesses, which are called the one plus one is more than two business, and which one are businesses like a coffee store, a real coffee store, because I'm here in Amsterdam, I have to be careful, a real coffee store at the corner where we know that if the crisis is over, even if it is long, one year from now, within two weeks, there will be a coffee store, within two weeks. So why did we keep one afloat for a whole year if it couldn't open? Yeah, so we will be forced, if the, if the closure goes on for a longer period, to make those type of choices. And for the very small companies, I have been highly in favor of the scheme that we had here to a small extent. We gave a 4,000 euros to very small businesses. Germany gave 14,000. I'm in favor of saying now with the second three months to these small businesses, give them a specific amount of money and they decide about their future. Rather than that we keep people locked up and these businesses locked up in paralysis. While we may not want them or they can open up in the future in one second. So we need to think about the allocation question, the longer the lockup is. Uh, so there will be differences. So that's the, basically the bottom line of the answer. Uh, the question on equity, um, it's a difficult question. We, we, what we have come up with is, we have come up with a very simple equity instrument, 
where uh, the policies so far basically have been very small companies we get we do in gift like this four four thousand in the Netherlands fourteen thousand Germany which is like equity in gift it is equity except it's in gift there's nothing in return and for the biggest companies they are political. We are rescuing them one way or the other. We are violating state aid rules. We are violating the internal market, all these type of things. So we need very strong European oversight uh, on, on the rescues of big companies. So, so those companies, our plan would not apply to because we, we don't believe in an objective way of creating a pandemic equity fund that will be objective in the largest businesses which are highly political in the way they will be treated. However, most businesses are of this medium-sized, of this medium-sized variety. There, it needs to be an equity instrument, which is very simple. So it's like getting a cash infusion in return for a particular obligation, if returns allow, to pay money in the future during a specific period. Plus, there is a buyout clause, which is crucial. The pandemic equity fund should not stay in businesses forever. The firm itself has a buyout clause where it can buy out the investor. And then it is a matter of calibrating, calibrating the parameters and of course making sure that you target the right firms because you don't want to target firms that were not viable to start out with. Thank you. So we've basically run through our time. We still have a bunch of questions. What I propose to do, because I think it's, uh, it's really pretty interesting and critical mass of attendees, is I'm going to read out the questions. There are five of them. Four of them are about conditionality. Uh, one of them is about state aid. And then I will let uh, Rule and Frank decide which ones they want to, uh, to answer. So let me try to take them in the, in the order that they were answered. There's an anonymous attendee, I hope he or she is still here, uh, who asks uh, very interestingly, do you think conditionality should contain elements aimed at rolling back human rights restrictions? For example, make certain support to Hungary or Poland conditional upon the re restoration of fundamental uh, freedoms. Then there is our colleague Anz Kolk, who says, uh, conditionality, rules of the game, can that also include something related to the Green Deal? Um, and she mentions that Rule has uh, referred to this in his, uh, his piece, uh, but she wonders what, whether other speakers also have ideas about this uh, in relation, for example, to loans to KLM and tying things to longer term uh, environmental and economic sustainability. Um, then uh, we have another anonymous attendee who asks, can we hear more about conditionality to, um, about how conditionality to provide incentives or coercive rules to invest and reform well can be built into the mutualization of euro bonds? And how can that be implemented in a way that's visible to the citizens of the frugal uh, four uh, countries? And then I'm going to uh, take the last question, which is about um, state aid. And that's from Stefanos Tiros, um, who says, it's been discussed how state aid rules have been relaxed to allow support for industries, but this fails their original purpose to have a level playing field in the single market. Are we sacrificing that level playing field because we're unwilling to support the industries on the European level? There, and um, I think that I, I, will, I will stop there. And first I give the floor to Rule. Uh, pick whichever of these questions you want to answer. Uh, just you know, take a couple of minutes to wind up, and then, uh, Frank, I, I give you the last word. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jonathan. What to include in conditionality? I, um, I thought the first proposal was very interesting. Um, you know, rolling back human rights restrictions, um, which is very important. But I'm not sure that. Um, I think you have to be careful with conditionality because if you um, I mean, if you include, uh, I think conditionality should be tied to uh, increasing growth potential. And 
um, even though no matter how uh, desirable it is to roll back those human rights restrictions, I think if we include too many things in conditionality, then probably it will not going to work and it will not be supported. And um, so I think it should be in a way quite, uh, quite specific. Um, I want to say a few things on, on state aid, and uh, I thought Arno's um, proposal was very interesting, but I think we should also be aware of uh, having, you know, governments or, you know, what, having um, stakes in companies and big companies because they would, will in the end be kind of get, become hostile, uh, ho sorry, um, hostage. Um, to you know the, how you say it, um, you know politicians want to um, you know deal with the day-to-day -day business of a company, and I think we we have to have to avoid such a thing. So um, so I think we uh, we should be very very careful in, in in that respect. And I think in his proposal, he also proposed to um, you know to somehow uh, you know kind of the management of the stakes to put you know to put that at a sufficient length from uh, from politicians um, so let me now hand over yeah. you have the last word yes well for the sake of time i'll be very short and just make some publicity for the, the publications of my colleagues both jean and, and Roel and arnaud i think people should read those publications because if you read them you'll see that the argument about collective action is, is, is solidarity, but it's not only solidarity. One of the arguments is that you need collective action in order to secure a true and correct level playing field across the member states. For instance, when it comes to state aid, if you leave that completely to the member states, they will be under huge pressure to take short-termist decisions, under pressure by big lobbies, and forgetting about longer term objectives like fighting climate change, etc. And so the argument for collective action at EU level is both that you, you, you can in that way safeguard a true level playing field and people who think that markets and correctly functioning markets are important should like that argument. And secondly, in that way, you can also secure that there is a link between the policies that will, de will be developed over the next weeks and months with stated goals that we have subscribed to, like climate, fighting climate change. And you find that in the publications by Jean, you find it also in what Arnaud has written, and you find it also in, in that statement by the European Fiscal Board that, uh, that rules circulated. And I think that argument could also be used more in the public debate, also in a country like, like the Netherlands. Obviously, basically, it, it, on one hand, it says, look, you have an advantage vis-a-vis -vis the Italian or the Spanish government because you're in a such, such a better budgetary position. And we would like the Spanish and the Italians not to be at a disadvantage. But it's an argument about a fair and a correct market. It's an argument about having a market function properly. And many Dutch people should like that. And I think we should press that argument a little bit stronger. Thank you, Frank. That is a perfect uh, segue to um, our next week's um, round table, which will be on national and European politics. It's evident that the issues that we have been discussing are not only issues of economic and social policy, but there are also issues of politics at both the national uh, and the European level. So I encourage you, if you uh, enjoy tonight's round table, to join us again next Wednesday night uh, at 8 p.m. And I want now just to thank uh, our four speakers and especially uh, our outside guest, Jean-Pierre Pisani Ferry for this uh, remarkable discussion. I wish all discussions of economic and social policy response uh, in Europe uh, were as constructive and as mutually complementary. So good night, everybody. Thank good you night. for being with us. Good and night. see you next week. Hey, bye bye, good night. Good night. Good night.
Thank you.